here today, and I'm getting him. Amen. We're proud of Brother Jared. Amen. Graduated from high school. We're proud of you, my brother. Amen. On behalf of your church, we want to present you a Bible because we know with this, your knowledge already of the Word, and you keep on reading this, God's going to guide your feet, keep you going in the right way, peace in your mind, joy in your hearts, praise God, twinkle in your eye and some fire in your bones. Amen. God's in charge. Keep Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he will lead you and guide you. Stretch your hands this way. Let's pray over him. Father, we thank you for Brother Jared. We thank you, Lord, for all of these graduates, and we appreciate you, Lord, for putting these parents in this church and bringing these young people up in this church and for your presence. We thank you for Jared as well as the others that are so active in the youth ministry and so involved in the worship of the Lord in these worship services. And we thank you for their faith. Lord, don't ever let him forget the experiences that he's had with you and continues to have and that he will continue to have more of them in greater ways as he enters into this new chapter in his life. Fill his mind with wisdom. Fill his heart with joy. And Lord, keep him covered in the blood sanctified, spirit-filled, rapture-ready, and your hand in his hand. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So order them, Lord, and keep them going, and show him your will and your divine direction. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. They don't know it, but I'm praying another prayer behind their back. God, keep them here. Don't ship them off anywhere. and Make them stay right here. Amen. Don't let somebody else get their attention and take them somewhere. Let them go find somebody and bring them back here. Amen. Praise God and we'll see it work. Amen. Praise the Lord. Got your Bibles turned with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And let me share a few things with you from the Word of God. And this as a Father's Day message goes to everybody. And Moses is not one that really is referred to as emphasis upon father except uh, over Israel. And uh, Abraham really has been given that title uh, out of his seed, but uh, came Israel. But Moses came along, and we know he had a family, but we do see some things in his life that every one of us, I think, need to learn from or can learn from. And uh, we want to see that. But before I get into it, let me let me... Say a little bit about fathers here, get a little bit. Story is told of a father of five children who came home with a toy one day, called his children together, and asked them which one should he give this present to. He said, who is the most obedient, never talks back to mom, and does everything he or she is told to do? There was a silence, and then all of them in harmony said, you play with it, daddy. Hallelujah. You'll have to explain that to some on the way home, but that's okay. And I did find something that does say more men like Moses' daddy. More men like Moses' daddy. And here's where it goes. Men don't always say what they mean. Women, you can say amen if you want. Men don't always say what they mean. When a man says it would take too long to explain, he simply means I have no idea what this is about. When a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, he's really saying, turn the vacuum cleaner off, I can't hear the TV. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, he's really meaning, are you still talking? When a man says, can I help with dinner, he's really meaning, is it not ready yet? Oh, when a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. He really means I probably cut a limb off of my body and I'm going to bleed to death, so get over here and help me as quickly as you can. When a man says I can't find it, he really means it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely clueless. Oh, I thought we'd get a response on When a man says you look terrific, he simply means don't try on another outfit. We're late and I'm starving. That's good from the men now. That was a good one from the men. When a man says, I don't remember saying that, it's because he means anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. 
In fact, all past comments become null and void after seven hours. <laughs> when a man said, last one, when a man says, that's not what I meant, he really means if something I said can be interpreted two ways and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other one. <laughs> we dads are something to deal with, aren't we? But aren't we all? Praise God, aren't we all? That's just human nature. We have a lot of good things there, but I thought that was rather unique. We have a good time, though, don't we? We're all human. Nobody's perfect. We try to improve. That's the key to it. Try to improve. When you make a mess, when you stumble and fall, when you do something that created the wrong response, then go figure out what it was so that you can bring a solution to your pollution, amen. Get it fixed, amen, and work on it to make life better for you as well as for everyone else, amen. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Four verses. Hebrews 11, chapters 11, verses 24 through 27. Talks about Moses. Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. Faith's hall of fame, the Bible scholars call it. Because it says, by faith, and then it goes down the chapter list and all these people that did such wonderful things for God, but they did it with great expense, great sacrifice, much suffering, persecution, and some even death. But they stood for God rather than be caught up in the world and do what the devil's got our society doing. And he's been working on that ever since the Garden of Eden. So you have to take a stand. Moses did that. He did take a stand. And I've battled over which one of these titles to use for this message. Uh, I've, I've used this, by faith, Moses overcame. I started to say instead of by faith, Moses overcame, I could have said by faith, Moses was an overcomer. Or I could have said by faith, Moses refused, refused and go down the list in these verses of what happened. So let me share with you these verses. Read them with me, and then I'll share a few things with you. And I'm sure you've got some plans, so I'm going to do my absolute best to get you out by 1130. Jesus, help me. Read with me. By faith, Moses. Now the first two words are the key words right here. Then I'm going to show you three other key words that, that describe Moses. But the whole chapter, by faith. Faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, what did he do? Refused. Now you got to see that. That's an act on his part, isn't it? Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What's the first word? Choosing. See, that's the second thing. There's a refusing and then there's a choosing. Look at this. Choosing rather to do what? Suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And we'll come back. Now, what's the first word here? Esteeming. That means to weigh it out. Think it over. Weigh it out. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the riches in Egypt. And he could have had them all. Than all the riches in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith. Somebody say by faith. By faith. He forsook Egypt. Look at that. Forsook Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king. For he what? That would be the next word. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured his life with a vision of seeing his God in heaven one day. Amen? So all of this is put together. Let's go back and look at these piece by piece. Uh, Moses ranks with Abraham, David, and Daniel as one of the truly great men of God under the Old Testament times. As a matter of fact, Moses is seen uh, very active in 1,500 years of the Hebrew history as God. He didn't live those number of years, but he had an active role in getting things going with getting them out of Egypt and getting them to the promised land, getting them in that direction. 
Amen. So we see him moving in that activity and had a great deal of influence and everything. He was a wise man. Everything Moses did stemmed from a choice he made when he was, as the Bible says, come to years. When he came, became a mature young man, he had to make some choices as to whether to stay in Pharaoh's palace and be an Egyptian leader or do what God had called him to do and be the man God put him on this world to be. Moses was very fortunate in that he had parents that had a strong faith in God. They believed in Jehovah and all of his titles. They believed in the commandments and followed them to the best they could. His parents were devout Hebrew parents and their faith and trust was in God. When they started, Pharaoh started killing all the infants uh, in Egypt. When he started killing them out, Moses' parents did something that required a great deal of faith. They built a little basket that would float and put their child in it, Moses, and put it in the river. Now that's the place where nobody would have looked for many children had drowned in that river. And they put him there to hide him when the military came their way to kill the infants. And when, when, he, when they put him in there and he floated down the river, you know the story. Who was it that found him? Floated right into the arms of Pharaoh's daughter. Isn't that something? Do you think that was a coincidence? No, that was a God incidence. God put it together. Anybody believe God works all things together? He acknowledged their faith and had the solution and the provision made and what a provision it was. Amen. He wasn't rescued by some shepherds living in a tent wandering in the desert. He was rescued by the most wealthy young lady in the entire nation of Egypt. She had the palace and anything and everything that could be offered. And Moses in, got, got involved in all of that, was able to be blessed by every bit of that because she took the child in not knowing who he was, where he was from, and literally so-called adopted him, raised him in the palace, and in so doing, he had the wealth of everything that could be education, the best education that could be. Uh, he had the best accommodations. He had the best of everything. It was right there. But the scriptures tell us that Moses... The, the big word here in this first verse is that he refused to accept and to live as an Egyptian ruler and leader. He refused. He refused. He would not do it. He knew how to say no. Stop a lot of folks don't know how to say anymore. That's why the devil has suckered them into committing every kind of sin there is. Our politicians don't know how to say no. A lot of folks don't know how to say no. And they just, whatever will keep things peaceful and keep things comfortable. I got news for you. The devil going to stay peaceful. There's a mean devil loose, and as soon as he gets by with one thing, he's going to create something else. So you just as well got to make up your mind of who you are, who you're serving, what you're made of, and what kind of character are you, and what kind of character are you built of, what has developed in you, what do you believe is right and wrong, what do you believe about involvement in this world and not. Because how you function, how you behave, how you talk, how you live, your children are watching you, and they will carry it on. And it will be amended or it will be dissolved according to their choices in the future. But we help make them. We help make them or break them. Come on now. We all have a part of it. So as parents, he said no. Temptation comes from three sources. Temptation comes from three sources. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Moses was an overcomer. He overcame the world by faith. He overcame the world by faith. You cannot overcome this world without a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. We are fallen nature because of Adam and Eve. We're all born in sin. Sin will rule and reign in us until there is a power that will wash that sin out. 
And that power is the blood of Jesus Christ, the only thing that can move it. But when the blood of Jesus washes that sin out and Jesus is invited in to be Lord and Savior and Master, he can put your life together and he can build character in you and you can be somebody that will change the course of this world for the people in your life as well as for yourself. Can I get a witness right there? This is, where it's, this is what it's about right here. And he overcame the world by faith. Where does faith come from? Comes from the word, don't it? That's coming up. He overcame the world by faith. He overcame the flesh by the spirit of God. He overcame the flesh by the ruling and reigning of the Spirit of God in his life, and that's how we'll do it. That's why we need to stay prayed up and fired up with the Holy Ghost working, ministering, and flowing through us so that we have the joy of the Lord and the wisdom of the Spirit and the anointing of strength, the unction to function, that power of the Spirit. And thirdly, he overcame the devil by the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. That's what Jesus used to overcome the devil. That's what you and I will have to use to overcome the devil is the inspired word of God. And he used that word and he overcame the devil. So Moses learned to say no. He did that by faith in God and overcame the world. He did that by staying prayed up and fed up in the word so he could be anointed of the Holy Ghost, overcome the flesh and keep it under control and say no to the flesh. And he overcame the devil by the word of God, suited up in the whole armor of God, Fight the good fight of faith and be a good soldier of the Lord, the word of God says. So we do that. Let's let's look at a few things. Three things right quickly. Moses overcame the throne of this world by faith. If you look at verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And what he did there was make a choice. He made a choice that he was not going to go with the sinful way of life, but rather he was going to be hooked up with what he knew is the people or are the people of God. And he took that stand. Look at that word refused. I want you to see that. If you got your scriptures, verse 24, after we leave the foundation by faith, there are, there's a word in each one of these that hooks up with these three points. Moses overcame the throne of this world by faith by refusing. If you don't take a stand as a Christian, You're going to be talking just like the people who are your neighbors, the people you work with, the people you're around. You'll be using their language. You'll be using their bywords. You'll be dressing like them, talking like them, and acting like them. Folks, there is a standard of holiness. There is a standard and a requirement to make it to heaven. But it's not a have to when you're in love with Jesus. It's a want to. I don't want to get adjusted to this world anymore. Amen. No one write a song about it, praise God. We don't want to get adjusted. You fall in love with Jesus, you want to get as close to Jesus as you can get. When you start drifting away from God, you'll start getting as close to the world as you can get. Let me try it on this side. When you want to get as close to Jesus, when you love with Jesus, you want to get as close to him as you can get. But when you start drifting from Jesus, you'll start wanting to get as close to the world. Then's when you start talking stuff you never talked before. Then you start going places you never went before. Then you start doing stuff you knew you were taught not to do. Parents, this is a good time to say amen, especially if your children are sitting beside you. Amen. All we can do is bring them up, but thank God we can do that. But then they've got to make a decision. Parents, I said this Mother's Day, I'll say it on Father's Day. We do the best we can in bringing them up, showing them the right way to live so they'll be ready when they die. But they'll have to make their own decision because you and I can't be with them all the time. Amen. And there will come a day if the Lord tarries that we'll scoot on up to heaven and they're going to be here on their own. And if they don't have something in their heart and in their head that tells them who God is and what this book is about, they're going to be caught up in this crazy world and they're going straight to hell like most of the world's going. The Bible says it is. So we say, he said, straight and narrow is the way that gets, that'll lead us to heaven. But hell hath enlarged its borders. There's so many going there. I don't want to go with the majority. I don't want to go with the majority. 
I don't want to talk like the majority. I don't want to act like the majority. This world is crazy. I think God is sitting on his throne scratching his head wondering where did common sense cease to be in people's brain? There is so little common sense today. I mean, when people don't even know what gender they are, so they're confused as to what bathroom to go to. And don't even know how to marry the opposite sex. It's a crazy world, I'm telling you. Who would ever thought this crazy? Common sense. Animals have got better sense than that. I said animals have got better sense than that. I don't understand it. It's all going back to the devil who is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And now we know deceive and confuse. And if you don't stay in this book and stay close to God and expressing your faith and worship of him in church services and private devotions and getting in and staying in tune with God, you will start swallowing the mess you're watching on TV and cable and internet and Facebook. And everybody says, well, it's all right. Look how many people's got. We're still looking. As big a racket as they're saying out here, this, whatever this lay, what, what is it, lesbian and gay movement, LG, something, another. Anyhow, started with the right letter, anyhow. Because that's where they're going. But if they don't straighten up, I don't want them to do that. And God don't want them to. God's wanting to save them. And thank God he is saving them for those that'll believe Amen. But, and they need to. If it wasn't for the grace of God, some of us would have been caught up in it. But the grace of God got a hold to us before we got deceived. Come on now. And it's affected us everywhere. It's a small minority. I heard it again this week. Less than half of 1% of the population of this country are in that category. I mean, we're talking, I think it was less than 500,000. It was, it was around 200, if I'm, if I'm not misquoting it, it seemed like it was around two to 300,000 is, is all this. But look at the ruckus. And they've got, they're trying to persuade everybody this is normal. So Hollywood, Hollywood, don't tell me how to live. This book does. This book does. Hollywood, don't tell me my values and what's right and wrong. This book does. This book does. And Hollywood's not going to get you and me to heaven. This book's going to get us to heaven. Come on now. That's why we need to make sure we're standing for what is right and make the right choices. Moses overcame the throne of this world, had everything by refusing. We got to refuse some things, people. Refuse to go with the flow downhill of this society. Refuse to go down with it. Refuse to go to hell with it. Refuse. Say, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to serve God. If I lose every friend I've got, if I lose half my family or more, if I lose whatever, you, you better look at where your soul's going to be in eternity. And if you'll stand for what's right, maybe, just maybe, God will anoint you in such a way that people will see God in you and they'll want to repent and be born again and get the real salvation of God. Woo! This is what he told it. Moses walked by faith and he rejected the position. It is believed that when he had come to age and that he had grown and was educated and uh, had grown up to a mature man that he was probably presented the throne of Egypt. He would have had a life of luxury. He would have had power over all the armies and over all the people. And they would have even looked at him as a god to deify him as they did other kings. But Moses refused the wealth refused the position refused the power refused everything that could have been fame and fortune and everything he could have wanted in life everything this crazy world is looking and wanting he turned all of it down and said I'd rather suffer with the children of God and know I'm in the will of God than to be blessed and preserved and, and or not preserved but to be blessed and prospered with all of this stuff and be without God because he realized something that's temporary it's temporary it's temporary and I'm going to tell you those we've been referring to and the Anyone else that's caught up in any kind of addiction and sins and anybody else that hadn't asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins and been born again, these folks are going to think about this real serious 
when the doctor looks at them and says, there's nothing else we can do for you. You've got maybe a few months, if that much. I guarantee you they'll start re-evaluating what's right and what's wrong and whether there's a God and a heaven and a devil and a hell. They're going to they're gonna have to weigh it out. They're going to have to weigh it out because is it worth it? Is any of this stuff worth it? I haven't seen anything that's worth it. They, they, we see this. Moses walked by faith. How did he overcome these temptations? He walked by faith. The scripture said by faith, by faith. He refused the throne of this world. Moses said by faith, if rather I'd rather be a slave fulfilling God's purpose than be the king of Egypt and not have God in my life. God's purpose was more valuable than a position, than a position, than a position. It was more valuable than a position. Second thing I want you to see is that Moses overcame the thrills of this world by faith. Verse 25 says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Choosing. He made a choice. We have a choice to make people. Every day of our lives we have a choice. And we If we choose God, choose Jesus, choose the word of God, choose to live righteously, conservatively, holy unto the Lord, then praise God, we've chosen to be Christian and make it to heaven. But if we choose not to accept the Lord, then we have literally chosen to remain under the slavery of Satan and sin and the flesh and the world. Which means we've chosen to send ourselves to hell. But if you choose Jesus, then you've chosen to get to heaven. It's our choice. We are, we, it's our choice. That scripture keeps telling us, and it's in Old Testament and the New Testament, that we will reap what we sow. That's good if you're living good. But it's not good if you're not living good. So the Bible tells us to, to look at this. You say, preacher, you're getting pretty strong this morning. Well, it don't seem like it does any good anymore to try to Be diplomatic. And we sure know what political correctness has got us. People don't know anything anymore. I'm just trying to tell you what the Word says. And everything I'm telling you is coming back to me because we're all under this together. But I am telling you this. If we're going to serve God and make it to heaven, let's make sure we get in the Word, get under the blood. Let's live right in church, at home, in the community, on the job, and anywhere else so that we'll make sure we are acceptable in the sight of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stay in this world. It's in bad shape. I want to go to heaven. There's a better place for us, and God's got it for us. But to get to heaven, you must be born again. Tell your neighbor, you must be born again. Hey, while I'm there, let me say this. It sure is fun, it is joyful, and it is blessed to live a born-again lifestyle. It is a pleasure. It is a privilege And it's my passion to live a Christian life and to enjoy the things of God and to testify of him. This scripture, Moses overcame the thrills of this world because he he chose rather to, to go with the people of God, suffer with the people of God, suffer affliction with the people of God, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Do you see that? Rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The Bible says that. Sin has pleasure. That's a fact. Sin will make you feel good for a season. Look at your neighbor and say, for a season. Sin has its good feelings and good moments. The problem with it is it's against God's will. Secondly, is temporary. Thirdly, the consequences of that sin are not worth that little few moments of pleasure you had with it. I said the consequences of sin are not worth those few moments of pleasure you had with it because then you got to live with a guilty conscience. You've got to get it straightened out with God. You've got to get rid of it. And sometimes you can get it right with God, but you've got to live with it for the rest of your life in this world because it'll leave a scar. I'm telling you, the devil hates you and me, 
And he loves to trick us, deceive us, and get us down, and then kick us while we're down. Stomp us while we're down. He's a mean, lying devil. Stop listening to him. Stop listening to him. He's talking to the whole world and they've turned every which away. But God's got a people. God's got a people. God's got a church. God's got a crowd of people who are blood washed, sanctified, anointed of the Holy Ghost. And they're living right and they're doing right and they're